most of my clients are, you know, senior level executives. The the salaries are jaw dropping. I don't want to dismiss that privilege makes it easier theoretically. Mm -hmm. I want people to focus on themselves and what you can do with your own intentionality. And P.S. There are plenty of people with lots of means who do not have work life balance, rest and renewal, feel intentional or strategic about their personal life. So just don't worry about it. <laughs> Let's think about you. Hey, it's Samantha Hartley of the Profitable Joyful Consulting Podcast. This is my little buddy Munson. This season we've been talking about empowering women and I specifically wanted to address balance and having it all because so often when I talk to my clients and other women consultants, what they will say is, well, Samantha, you don't understand what it's like to try to balance all of the things in my life because you don't have kids. And it's true that all my children have fur. I have two big dogs and a cat. Uh, and I want to have them in my life and I structure a lot of my life around spending time with my animals or going on adventures and hikes and things like that with them. However, it's not the same thing because at the end of the day, I can put my animals in a crate and that is not possible for my clients who are moms. So I wanted to have a guest on who could talk about balancing and having it all in our lives and how possible that is and what are the difficult choices that we need to make and do they have to be difficult choices? The comedian Stephen Wright said, uh, you can have it all, but where would you put it? <laughs> and I feel like that's the dilemma that a lot of my my clients and other women consultants have is like, I want to have it all, but there's only so many hours in the day and there's only so much of me to go around. And how do I how do I do that? And instead of trying to come up with the answer myself, I wanted to ask Joelle to share that with you. Years ago, when I worked with Joelle, uh, I would hear the messages I would that we were creating for her business. I would hear the uh, case studies that she would tell me about her work with clients. And I would feel like, I can't even believe this is possible. She's doing the thing that we all dream of. And then I read her book, The Inner Edge. And I was just like, it's true. It, it, it really is possible. And I am doing as close to this for myself as I, as I can do. I mean, I really feel like I'm I'm ever better at this every day. And yet I want to help remove any obstacles to you doing that. And I feel like hearing this from another source, from somebody who is um, doing this with kids is really important because in balancing career and family, there just is a certain definition of family, which feels levels of complexity higher than the version that I have. So I'm super excited to share Joelle with you, introduce her if this is your first time uh, learning about her, share her work because she's uh, brilliant and completely aligned philosophically with so many of the ideas that I've shared with you here. So let's meet Joelle. Joelle KJ is a director with the Leadership Research Institute who specializes in leadership development for senior executives in Fortune 500 companies. She's an executive coach, keynote speaker, author, and an expert in personal leadership. Her mission is to help leaders achieve what they want to achieve and lead the lives they want to live. You're going to hear us talk about intentionality, about balance, about privilege, all of the things that I want to make sure that we address. But the key thing that I want you to hone in on is what I'll say to my clients all the time when they're with me. You are powerful. Uh, you're going to get what you want. So the most important thing for you to do is to decide what you want. Now, as you listen to Joelle and me in this conversation, that's what I want you to keep in mind. You can have what you want. All right, with that, enjoy this conversation. Joelle, I love stories of transformation. So can you talk to us about someone that you've worked with who was experiencing the kind of balancing issues that we're going to get into in this episode and how things went for her? Well, one of my favorite people is such a shining example of this. Her name is Hannah. And when I met her, I was her executive coach when she was working in a high rise Fortune 500 company with burning the candle at both ends kind of a lifestyle. Um, she worked 24 seven. If she wasn't on her phone, she was in a meeting. And if she wasn't in a meeting, she was in the car going to someplace important. It just was unsustainable. So when she decided to leave that life, she took a sabbatical. And when she did, 
her transformation was dramatic. She really took the time off. She spent the entire summer singing and dancing, like literally in a production because she loves to sing and dance. She went to the beach. She got enough sleep. And when it was over, she said, I don't want to give this up. I don't want to go back to that life that I had before. So she started her own company. And I thought, can you sustain this balance while you do start your own company? And she did. So she now has a seven figure firm that Mm -hmm. serves on a national level and she's still singing and dancing. Hooray. Hooray. That is exactly the kind of thing that I love to hear. So I know that the there's so many topics that you and I align around. And one of them is that uh, like you can make things happen that you want to have happen for yourself. So before we go too much further down that, let's take a step back and just talk a little bit about your story. Were you always somebody who could like balance career and family? And were you good at this all along and you brought this gift to your clients? Or was that something that you struggled with before? Well, I would say it's both. I really do value quality of life. I mean, I love life. I think there's so much fun to be had. So, you know, I have a, I have a brand new little puppy. I've got two sons. One of them's in college, you know, which is extremely fun and also involves traveling back and forth and learning new things together as a family. I have a senior in high school and all the activities that come with that. And I do like to do things for myself. You know, I like to go running. I like to travel. I love to ski, paddleboarding. So there's so much in life that I think is just fun and enriching and joyful. And I want to make room for that. And also, it's a struggle. Yeah. It's a struggle every day, you know, Mm -hmm. to have a... um, Our team is, you know, proud to be a seven-figure corner of a firm and serving clients worldwide. And I work four hours a day, four days a week, you know, so how do I do all that on a a daily basis when the emails are coming and the phone is ringing and the text won't stop chiming and there's appointments and my calendar is full and this team needs me and I need to show up for that video and I've got all these things going on and it just piles and piles and piles and piles on. Finding a way to manage all those things is a daily struggle. Mm -hmm. It's a daily struggle. Um, But I think it's one worth winning. Uh, absolutely. So I'm sure if I were a listener, I'd be saying, okay, yeah, but the thing that you described that's the daily struggle sounds my, like my life yeah. uh, and and hobbies sound wonderful and like a luxury and time for myself and all of those things, but, but how? So if you were just to kind of outline the big picture strokes, because we can only get so far in this, but like, what are the, the, the main principles that someone would need to know who wants to bring more balance into her life? So I want to start with a philosophy of life that I recommend. Um, It's called personal leadership. Mm -hmm. So I, all of my expertise is in personal leadership. So let me talk about that for a minute as the framework for everything else that we talk about today. Personal leadership is the ability to lead yourself so that you can achieve what you want to achieve and lead the life you want to live. So if you think about it, leadership is the ability to define a compelling vision for the future and then inspire people to achieve it. Personal leadership is the ability to do that for yourself. Mm -hmm. So when you think about designing your life, the very first and most important thing is to be the leader of that life. You may be a leader. You may be a leader in corporate America. You may be leading your own consulting firm. You may be leading your family, your community. You might be leading because of your ideas or your contributions or your inventions. But every single one of us is also leading a life. And so the most important principle is to be sure that you are taking the lead, that you are being reflective and strategic and intentional about the life that you're designing so that you can create the vision that is right for you. Now, within that philosophy, then if we think you know, specifically about you know, creating a vision for your life, um, first, I would be curious to know, do you have that vision? Mm-hmm. You know, every one of us needs to stop at least long enough to think, what is the end result here? Mm-hmm. Can I picture what it would be like if my life and every day was exactly what I wanted it to be. 
Once you've done that, then you can start asking yourself the big questions. Questions like, what do I want? What do I need to focus on to get it? Right? What's my action plan? Your audience are skilled in all of this. They mm-hmm. are business women. They are successful. They are entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, business women. They know how to do this. Yeah. Now, can you do it for yourself? Yeah. So I love really starting from the being state with that vision of like, what does the life look like? And what does it feel like to me? I love vision statements that feel like you can step into them and kind of like walk around in them. Like if this is the snapshot of what I want my life to be, and then I step into it, I'm like, how does this feel? What does it smell like? What's, what's comfortable here? Where are the edges of it? And then as you're saying, like, um, bringing that, that specific focus to, okay, so from within here, if I were to operate, if it's my car, my vision is my car that I step into, then where do I want to take that? So I think that's a really smart step. And it's super aligned with the things that I'll talk about on here. And that I talk about with my clients with definitely like vision is the starting point for anybody's business. And then the next thing is really, you know, contained in the vision are the are those values and, uh, and, and things like that. But bringing intention to things, because if we don't do something intentionally, then we're kind of like having it be accidental. And even as you were describing things before, I was like, when people are on that kind of like, go, 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 go 24 seven, it's like, they've lost control of their lives, and they're not actually in charge of it. So I really like the idea of this as like personal leadership is about taking control back of your own life and deciding where you want that to go. So it, uh, it just really resonates. What's the next thing that we do after we decide those goals? Your idea of vision is a perfect next step. And I'm going to differentiate between, you know, sort of step one and step Mm -hmm. one A. (laughs) So, you know, step one is asking like, what do I want for my life? Can I see it? I think step two is clarifying that. And it is an exercise, you know, it is a concrete activity where you sit yourself down and you put in writing, what is my vision? You and I share a vision. I love the name of your podcast, Profitable Joyful Consulting. It is so clear, right? Well, my vision is success plus quality of life. And they are aligned, right? The success Mm -hmm. in my vision is about being financially successful, successful from a business standpoint. And then the quality of life in my vision is like your joyful right? Mm -hmm. But because I know that I can assess any opportunity on those two scales. Mm -hmm. So I would really recommend taking that step of actually writing down the vision, having not just the, I see it vision, but the, I wrote the vision statement step from there. Then it's a daily process every day asking yourself, okay, what do I wish this day would be like? If I was, if I had reached my vision, then what would it look like? You know, and how close am I? And is there any one thing I can do that would get me a little bit closer? So if we think about your vision as your ideal, right? Your ideal life, you can picture it all. And this morning is so far away from that. Let's give an example. Let's say, for example, um, you know, yesterday, I wanted to have a quiet, lovely writing day, no appointments. I wanted to get up and go to the gym. And then I was going to take my little puppy out and, you know, give her some, some TLC and a little walk. And then I was going to enjoy the summer day. Then I would like eventually get into work around 10, focus on what I wanted to focus on and the quiet, happy spaces that I love in my office and then finish around, you know, two o'clock and be like, okay, I'm done for the day. What am I doing tonight? And then go do something fun. Like, you know, it happened to be a meeting at my son's school. And to me, you know, that's where all the friends are. And it was super fun. So like, Mm -hmm. I know what it should look like. This is not how my day transpired. Right right out of the gate, my phone will not stop chiming. People are constantly texting. And then I like made the mistake of going on my email. And then there's like all these expectations with deliverables and due dates and things I'd totally forgotten about. And then my Mm -hmm. computer crashed. Like, are you got to be kidding me? It's like a sign from the universe. So, you know, and I was able to just stop and go, okay, here are my choices. A, I just go do my happy day and and all this other stuff. I'm just going to push it to the side. I haven't known to do that. Or I could say, today is not the day. What's on the text? What's on the email? Let me get this computer fired up again. But that didn't feel right either. So I thought, well, okay, what can we do here that would be a happy marriage? So I kind of like went into triage. 
Let mm-hmm. me handle the texts that are urgent. Let me handle the to-dos that are urgent. Make sure I meet that deadline. I'm going to shut down the computer that's failing me because it's giving me heart failure. And now I'm going to take four hours from 10 to two. And I'm going to write what I wanted to write. So you can, it, that when I say that, you know, the work-life balance for me is on one hand, you know, it's an everyday kind of a thing. On another hand, it's a struggle. That's what it looks like. I don't know mm-hmm. if that's helpful, but the to-do mm-hmm. there, back to your question is, Make that a daily practice. Visit mm-hmm. your vision. See how close you can, you are so far and then make a decision that's more closely aligned. Well, what I really love about that is that it's a merger of I had the ideal day and my day was a little um, unbalanced and I managed to make the best of the thing. I'm, tr- I'm trying to make it look as close to my vision as possible without having it be like, um, you know, Hannah b- in the before scenario. I think that's really realistic. What I find with my clients is a lot of times they hold themselves to this impossible standard, which is like, it's either perfect or it's nothing. It's I'm, I'm either perfect or it's uh, completely destroyed. So I love having you model. This is as somebody who's like amazing at balancing work and life and personal and all of the things. This is what that looks like. It looks like um, pro- I don't know if compromise is a good word or if that's the word that you choose to use, but I feel like it's an ongoing negotiation and an ongoing in the moment adjustment to what is realistic and what is possible for that day. And does it t- tend to trend closer to the vision or does it tend to trend further like off the rails? Oh gosh, closer to the vision, closer to the vision. Absolutely. I mean, I did have this question posed to me once, you know, um, so my team does a lot of leadership development. I'm an executive coach personally um, and work one on one. But there are, you know, many settings where my my whole entire team or firm works in, you know, corporate settings, doing leadership development programs and that kind of a thing. And I told a story once about um, the sort of the ideal life, right, how you paint the picture of your ideal life. And then, you know, once you've done that, once you have the vision, then you set up about trying to create that. I mean, that is the process. Right. Yeah. And so I told her some of that and she said, well, what percentage of the time, like, is that like a hundred percent of the time or is that like 80% of the time? Cause it really seems uh-huh. like far away for me. And I remember at that time saying like, oh gosh, I mean, I think it was like 60% of the time. Mm-hmm. She was like, oh, so if I could do it like 20% of the time, like, would that be okay? Yeah. Yeah. That would be okay. And then you learn over time to get to 30%. Or 80% or Mm -hmm. some days it feels like you're at a hundred percent when you're in your hammock with the, you know, drink in your hand and the sun is shining and you're on vacation and your team is back home working for you. You think, yeah, this is the life I did it. I completely agree with that. I'm so glad that you used a number like 20% because I feel like this is where, this is where, you know, one of the things, Joelle, that I describe is that my clients don't tend to be motivated by money. So when I talk about money stuff and they say, well, I don't really care if I make um, a million dollars, I'm like, okay, well, think of it as like an A and then there's an A plus and an A minus because a lot of us tend to be good students. So I'm like, just think of it as like getting a really good grade and kind of the more money you make or the closer you hit to your goals, the closer you are with a grade. But then somebody hears like 60% and they think, well, that was a D. That's almost a failing grade or 20%. That's failing. Okay, but more than zero is already progress for you. And so we can't really use that metric for this. We have to think it's better than I was doing before. And we're going to do, you know, two steps forward, one step back sometimes. But as you're saying, like you're 60% back then, and it sounds like you're much, much closer to your ideal now. And it's funny that you mentioned hammock because we got a hammock this summer. I've spent days in the hammock. And yesterday I was um, on a charter fishing trip. So this is like what you and I, I think are speaking from the experience of like, these are our values and we're trying to uh, help others to say like, how closely can you get your life to conform to your own vision and your own values? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of times when I listen to, you know, I don't know, podcasts and webinars and, um, (laughs) there'll be these suggestions and they just, it starts to overwhelm me where, you know, you should do this, you should do that. You should do this. You should do this. Always do this. Always do that. I think, oh my gosh, always. Well, what if I just did it, you know, whatever it is, like, let's say in this case, you know, aligning my day to my vision for my day. Um, What if I don't feel like I can do that every day? Um, What if I don't even feel like I can do that once a week? And I feel like, well, could you do it once? Like just, just once try it and then change for a change. You know, just see, like, is there one thing in my day? 
So for instance, I have a client who she just really benefits from meditation. She loves to meditate. When we were working together last year, she said it had been years since she like actually sat herself down and like did a really good meditation. And we had this exact conversation. I was like, okay, Stella, we're not saying that you have to meditate always to change your life. She, you know, she's like, you know, reports to the CEO in a global fortune 50 company. Like you don't have to commit to that. It's too hard right now. If, if that's how you feel, but, and you don't even have to do it once a week or once a day, but could you do it like, just once. And she did. And she was like, okay, Saturday, mm-hmm. I'm getting on an airplane. I am flying to see my parents. I'm going to like bring my head headphones and I'm going to like meditate on the plane. And I thought, well, that is lovely, right? It's a gentle step. It's for you. Nobody's saying you have to do it. There's no pressure here. But if you want to meditate because you feel like that makes you feel centered and clear, well, then let's see if we can find a time for you to do that. And she did it once. And she was just so amazed. She said, I felt like myself again. Mm -hmm. I just needed that time to connect to, you know, the silence and the stillness that rests within. And now she has brought meditation back into her life. So that's Mm -hmm. all she needed to do was get there once. Mm -hmm. That was enough. So good. So good. Really. Uh, I think it's that just that pass fail or it has to be perfect or it's nothing. So I, I love that, that concept. It sounds to me, and I, I want to make sure that we follow if there's additional steps, I want to get back to your steps, but it sounds to me that there's decisions. There's all of these micro decisions that have to be made during that day when you're attempting to conform. What's the decision-making criteria in there? So actually I find it easiest and most successful to plan way ahead. So we've been talking about the day, right? The decision, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but the real secret is to plan way ahead, way ahead. The farther you can go, the more successful you'll be. So the reason that I knew that I wanted to spend all day yesterday writing is because a year ago I decided to put pen to paper on my next book. And so I looked at my calendar and I thought, well, when is that going to happen? Where is space I can protect? And once I knew what that was, I could start conveying that to people or just making decisions around it. So originally, I didn't have any appointments yesterday. I mean, if you looked at the calendar, the calendar was clear because I made it that way Mm -hmm. last year. And then when you get there, the decision is I'm looking at a beautiful, empty, clear calendar. That's all for me. Mm -hmm. And then all this noise comes along. It's like messing up my space. So then the decision becomes this like, you know, um, impulse where you're like, oh my gosh, I have to decide right now, which is it? Is it this or is it that? Is it this or is it that? And you may make the right decision or you may make the wrong decision for you in that moment. And either way, you will have the chance to do it again. Mm -hmm. So if I would have failed yesterday, I would have thought, okay, that did not work. I want like no interruptions. So I have to do even better. Like I'm not, I'm not, I'm turning off my phone, you know, when I get home from the gym. So no more chiming. I'm not mm-hmm. looking at my email on writing days. Like I decided that I learned it. So perfect. it is a daily process of, I knew it was perfect and, and ideal. And I can see that this is not it. And what am I going to do right now? And then circle back and go, okay, let's do it again. Right. Let's do it again and see if we can get it better next time. Mm-hmm. I also hear in there really good boundaries. So I learned I need to turn off my phone here and I protect my time on writing days and things like that. So uh, knowing what those boundaries are, what what kind of a role is that playing for you in creating your ideal day and creating balance in your life? Boundaries are one of the tools of work-life balance, right? So if you imagine we have a big toolkit, like, you know, all, with all the levels, you know, where you put like all the different tools. Boundaries would take up a big space. Mm-hmm. It's so important to know like what's in and what's out. What's okay and what's not. What do I prefer and what do I not? What am I going to say yes to? What am I going to say no to? And the more of this work you can do on your own ahead of time, the better you'll be in the moment. And that's honestly, Samantha, I mean, I think that that is where and why most people fail. So again, one of the secrets is all of this that we're talking about, it comes from your reflective time. As I said before, being strategic and intentional. So what does that look like? It looks like you on a walk in the morning, making decisions before your day starts. It looks like you pen to paper with a journal. It looks like you with your executive coach or your coaching program. It looks like you 
you know, designing plans on your computer, taking the time for yourself to, 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 to plan all of that. That is what makes it successful. If you're constantly in the moment, it's, it's just, it's too hard. I'll give you another mm-hmm. quick analogy. Um, I'm trying to eat healthier. I mean, I'm a healthy eater to begin with, but you know, like I haven't been a vegan for my whole life. And so, you know, trying to give up something like caffeine, mm-hmm. you know, your, your body's used to caffeine. So you've got that going against you. Um, you love coffee. So there's that, you know, all the things, all the reasons. But if I decide I want to give up caffeine or, or drink less caffeine, I need to decide that before uh-huh. I want the cup of coffee. If I'm trying to decide in the moment, if I'm like, oh my gosh, like yeah. I'm going to a meeting, I haven't had any coffee because I said I wasn't going to drink any caffeine. And now the meeting's starting and I'm like sleepy and, and distracted. Like I'm going to be like, you know what? Forget about it. Tomorrow. I'll yes. sleep again. Today, I just totally. need to go. So it's all, it's all about the beforehand. That makes total sense. And uh, it has also been my experience that in the moment, you know, when those, when all those uh, texts are coming in or all those emails are there, we're, then you give into my peacemaker who wants to make everyone happy or my, you know, slippery boundaries where I just uh, say yes to things that I don't really want to, or my procrastinator who says, I'm not going to deal with any of that. I'm just going to go do my thing and um, creates even more problems in the lack of compromise. So it is, it's definitely not a place to, uh, to take action from. Can we just for a moment, just talk about the idea of balance? Because I know there's people who are even opposed to the idea of that we can balance all of these things and that it needs to be much more about uh, integration. And I do think that that's something that happened for us during COVID, which is that the boundaries between work and home blended, the, the boundaries between family and office and all of that. So when you think of what we're doing, are we really balancing all of the ourselves, all these versions of ourselves? What's really happening there? I am of two minds when it comes to this question about is balance really possible? First, there is my own life philosophy, and then there's what I've learned, and they're both helpful. So if if it's okay, I'll share them both. Definitely. So I always say, if you want to know if work-life balance is possible, just ask someone who has it. I mean, those of us who are living balanced lives are like, what else would there be? Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're out there in the blogosphere, there are just oodles and oodles of people. Well, balance is never possible. You know, you really, if you, you, you just can't have it all, you need to give up trying. Or mm-hmm. they'll say, well, you can have it all, but not all at once. You know, or yeah. you can have it all, but maybe, um, you know, whatever. All these, and I just think you can wiggle your way out of it however you want. But, you know, if you don't believe you can have work-life balance, I guarantee you're not going to have work-life balance. Like that is the end of the story. If you believe that you want to live that way, and that that's possible and good, and that you can also be successful at the same time as you're enjoying your life and being rested and renewed, then you will create that. So the mm-hmm. mindset is just absolutely critical. So I do believe in work-life balance because that's how I live my life. Mm-hmm. I also think we have so many wonderful metaphors for balance in the world. I don't know why it would become something that is unattainable. Like just think about the actual physical act of being balanced, You know, standing on your own two feet. If you try to stand on one foot, like you're a little off balance and you have to kind of do this. And, you know, it's like maybe you'll fall down, but you'll get back up and you'll try again. You'll probably be laughing while you do it. Right. Like we can balance. It doesn't mean you're standing motionless. It doesn't mean that it's perfect. You know, you're not made of stone. It takes practice and and you fall down. But, yeah, we balance a lot of things. We balance our checkbooks. We balance in yoga. You know, we balance. So so I believe in balance. And I think that anyone who wants balance in their life should believe in it too and believe in yourself that you deserve that. Yes. Yeah. I, and I couldn't, did you say both of your definitions? No. Want to hear the other one? Yeah, I do. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I interviewed a woman who is a professor um, at Duke and I apologize for not having her name because she deserves full credit for what she taught me. But she had a model for, for work-life balance that I thought was just beautiful. And, and what she said was, it just depends on who you are and, and how you choose to balance. And she had three options. So one is, there are people who are like, work hard, play hard. You know, they're all in for like, <laughs> yeah, for like you know, months. Like you're, you're invested, you're committed, you're doing, you're achieving, you're you know, accomplishing. And then when you're done, you're done. You are in the hammock, mm-hmm. taking a vacation, 
right? So there's that. Then there are the people who compartmentalize. That's their second um, second option is where they're like, oh, I can, I can, I can do it all. I just need to chunk it out. And this is like, so you sounded like you were the work hard, play hard, right? <laughs> um, compartmentalizing is like where it's at for me. Not in a bad way. I think there's a psychology way of conception of compartmentalizing yeah. that's not good where you're not like not right. facing reality. It's not that kind of compartmentalizing. It's more like when I'm with you, I am with you. Like this time is 100% only mm-hmm. about you, Samantha, and all of your audience here today. And this is where I want to be. When we are complete, I will close my laptop, take off my jacket and go outside. Mm-hmm. And I'll be in a totally different space. So pretty much every day of my day is like that. So that's compartmentalizing. And that mm-hmm. works for me. Then there are people who are work-life integration. So I have, you know, one of my business partners um, was saying that his wife is just brilliant at this. She used to be an executive. Now she does other things that are more entrepreneurial. And she just is very fluid about the whole thing. You know, so she'll be making dinner, talking to a client on the phone, or she'll put down the client phone call when she was making dinner and listen to her son talk about his day, you know, and then after she's done with all that, she might open up her laptop and check some emails and, you know, write something, you know, a report or, you know, check some numbers. And it's just for her very, very fluid. And I think that is beautiful too. Here's where I think the, the biggest danger zone is and where my antenna go up is when someone else tells you which is right for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's why I like that so much. It's not saying like, oh, we have to be integrated. I would have heart palpitations. If I had to try to like open a spreadsheet when I was trying to talk to my son, like, I don't want to do yeah. that, but that doesn't mean that you don't want to do that. <laughs> so my, my business partner's wife can happily knock herself out doing it that way. And I'm going to do it my way. And you're going to do it your way. And the upshot is we all feel good. Yes. Yeah. Well, and I really like that. And I'll tell you in all of my, uh, all of my, my husband's um, nutrition journeys, if we learned nothing, it was that what works for one person doesn't work for another person. And that if I ate that, I would feel terrible and that someone, someone eats that way and they feel great. Uh, and I once ate that way and I didn't feel, uh, I felt great then. And now I don't feel like things are, things do need to be dynamic and ever evolving. And I think I, I think those three identities are amazing. I think also as you as you name them, I feel like a little hybrid between one and three, which probably is yet another option of is of like these are the discrete ones, and then you know mix and match accordingly of whatever works for you. So uh, those those to me really work. What I want to um, represent on behalf of my audience is the but but but. Uh, contingent who was like, but, but, but I have, I'm a sandwich generation. They, they might say to me, and I'm taking care of my parents and I'm taking care of my kids and I'm trying to run this business. And then there's my husband. And also I have these girlfriends and uh, like my health goes by the, like, what about people for whom there are just in terms of the compartmentalization, there's so many compartments. It's um, almost impossible for them to get to them all. Yeah. It's so challenging. Those challenges are real. It is not your imagination and it is not a failure on your part if your plate is overflowing, where you're just buried under the avalanche. That is, it is real. And how do you know I don't have that too? So yeah. I don't mean that to be flippant. Yeah. Um, no. but the, way, the way it comes to me is since I work in corporate settings, you know, if we're talking about work-life balance, every time someone will say to me, yes, well, you know, uh-huh. I know you have your own practice and you can make your decisions. Yeah, I can. And you can also make decisions. You might not make mm-hmm. the same decisions I make, but you can make your decisions. And and are you? Yeah. Um. So, you know, and, and what I have learned, the benefit of executive coaching is you get to hear what's really going on in people's lives and what's really going on in their heads. And so the same person who's you know, on the Today Show, because she you know, has the work-life balance and wrote a book about it and is just so rested and renewed and looks vibrant and all those things. But she also has aging parents and little kids and a dog who's sick and a, and a husband who left or, you know, clients that didn't pay. Like everyone's got their stuff. Everyone's got it. And so as much as I, I sympathize, I empathize, and I have been there, sister, I know how hard it can be. I know. And also, don't let that stop you. You know, we're all in this together. We're all just doing our best. And you can absolutely, totally. I, I, you know, I, I, I totally hear what you're saying, and I feel like that's the the thing that happens for a lot of us is that we, um, is that we seek separation instead of um, finding what the commonalities are. And as you're saying, it's like, well, but you can't imagine because of this thing, and. 
you know, everybody, everybody has their thing that they're working on. Uh, I, I will hear uh, the yes, because you're self-employed or no, I can't do that because I'm self-employed or, well, I have small children. Well, I can't do it because I have small children or, you know, whatever is the thing. And it, it, to me, it takes it back to the vision that you talked about uh, and your ideas about what is possible for you. Um, but I don't want to. So I, I kind of want to make that as a complete idea. And then I want to also open up kind of privilege, because I think that there is also a certain amount of privilege that comes with these things that. Uh, creates kind of kind of uh, particular difficulties or particular disadvantages for people who don't have them. Is that still the case of don't project your exceptional situation on another and assume that they're not having their own challenges? Or are, are there kind of special, is there special advice that you've given to the women that you've coached who you've seen in situations where they didn't have access to the same privileges or they weren't personally from the, those same kinds of backgrounds where they could and enjoy the privilege that was accorded to, we'll just go with the classic, like tall white man. Yes. So the most important thing to remember is this is all and only about you in your life circumstances, finding the balance that is going to work for you in the ways that you can. That's it. Like most of my clients are, you know, senior level executives, the, the salaries are jaw dropping. Their bosses are, I mean, it's, it's just laughable. The, the money that flows in the, that in that echelon of corporate leadership, but like I don't have that, right? I, I have a lot of other privileges that are amazing, and I'm so grateful. And I have people I know who are in vastly different circumstances: family, friends, people who I've worked with, people in our community, people at church, people at the nonprofit I work with, people that the nonprofit serves, and they do it their way. So I just think it's a distraction. It is not, it is not um, unreal, right? I mean, fortunately, fortunate people with privilege likely have some options available <laughs> that maybe all of us don't. Like I was just talking with someone recently who's, you know, the way that he gets his sort of work-life balance is he has a private jet. And so he goes where he wants to go and he wants to go. And then he can take his kids with him. And then he like can have quality time on the private jet. I think, well, that is, <laughs> that is just amazing. But yeah. maybe my quality time looks like sitting with my son at the kitchen counter when he comes home. Mm-hmm. Right. So I just, I just, I don't want to dismiss that privilege makes it easier. Theoretically, mm -hmm. I want people to focus on themselves and what you can do with your own intentionality. And P.S. There are plenty of people with lots of means who do not have work-life balance, rest and renewal, feel intentional or strategic about their personal life. So just don't worry about it. <laughs> Let's just think about you. I love it. It's a great point. So what's the, as a mom, and I remember when I, when I have you know, you and I've been connected for a long time. So I remember when your sons were younger, uh, when your sons were younger, uh, there were unique challenges that you're having a little bit less of now because you're a half of an empty nester. So, or although maybe I shouldn't say that because that might not be a good thing. But uh, when you think about the challenges that um, working moms have, especially the moms who are running businesses and they have kids who are... Uh, they're actively having to parent in the home. What's what are those unique challenges, and how? What is the advice that you have to to business owning consulting moms? So, if we go back all the way to the beginning of this call, the principles are the same. The practices are the same. So, let's go back to some of the things we talked about and just apply it to all of us who are moms and have to do this every day, right? So, we talked about taking leadership of your own life. If you are the one who is in the lead, you create the vision, you make the decisions, and then you drive yourself toward that amazing life. So let's add on with kids, right? If I am an entrepreneur or solopreneur working from home and I have little kids, like, you know, three and five, mm -hmm. what is my vision for what that looks like? 
Have I done those things that you and I talked about? Did I get the picture, like the vision in terms of visualizing it? Can I see what it would be like if my kids were like happy and content and attended to, not neglected, you know, not sitting in front of some electronics all day long, but like, you know, well-adjusted, healthy kids with interesting lives. And also I had a successful business. Can I picture that? Am I picturing that? And then also, hmm, what if I put pen to paper and made that vision statement? That's how I came up with successful quality of life. I was like, I want them both. <laughs> I want both the time with the kids and the successful business. What does that look like? So I made decisions about what that looked like for me. And all the things that we're talking about, you know, that daily, daily decisions or planning way ahead of time or, um, you know, telling people far in advance, I take a sabbatical every summer, every summer. So, you know, that's what mine looks like. So it's all of everything we've talked about. Just start from the beginning and add the word with kids and then put in the age of your kids. So if they're two and a half and five, that is just its own kind of special challenge and might have its own kind of special boundaries. Like I know for me, there is nothing I loved better than a great nanny. I spent plenty of time with my kids. My days were short. We had mornings. I walked them to school. We had afternoons. I picked them up from school. You know, they were around in the afternoons. I went to all the soccer fields and all the, all the stuff. But I didn't have to do the dishes because I paid a nanny. My nanny mm -hmm. was a college kid who I paid $10 an hour. So in case like that seems out of reach. Yeah. It turned out it wasn't, wasn't so bad. Yeah. Or, you know, neighbor kids, your mom, someone on your block who wants to be in the same situation you are. Kids had choices. I would give them choices like about, you know, how would you like to do something after school? Mom's going to be working. So I can't do it every day. And maybe they wouldn't want that anyway. But what do you want right. to do? Dance? Soccer? After school program? Spend time with kids? Friends? Like, what do you want to do? You, what you cannot do is sit in front of a computer for two hours every afternoon. Let's figure it out. And then the more your kids get older, the more those decisions change. So now they're seven and 12. What does that look like? You know, are there afternoons where you go to a friend's house so that I can finish my work day? What are you going to do on the days that, you know, there's no school and mom has to work? What's that going to look like? Let's make some decisions together. Mm -hmm. All very planful. Now the mm -hmm. kids are 18 and 20. What does that look like? You know, can I, can I help you at all hours of the day, every day? Let's see what that looks like. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then those decisions. So and it's all it's all different. It's all individual. So I don't want the I don't want the message to be um, you should farm out your kids. I want the message to be where do you want your kids to be? Mm -hmm. So I, I'll share one more story and then, um, you know, turn it back over to you. But I had one client who and her kids were like teens and tweens, you know, like in that 12 to 14 range. She was like, I love to have my kids in the house. I like to hear the noise. I want them to have their friends over. I want them to be playing basketball. I want them to be like around. I want them to, you know, I want them around me, but I also want to work. So what she decided was that when she was ready to actually do something and the kids were also around, she would like put the doctor is in sign on her door <laughs> and just be like, mom, mom is like at work. I'm in with my clients. And, you know, if you really need my attention desperately, you can text me. <laughs> and I will like keep a, keep a little eye on that. Right. And then I'll come get you. Mm -hmm. And if you don't need me, this is a good time to like find something to occupy yourself. So it really is about those boundaries. It really is about the moment to moment decisions and the long term decisions about what do you want this to look like? Well, and I love that you're, again, modeling, like planning this out in advance so that it's not a surprise in the moment so that it's like, gosh, we never thought what we'd be doing or oh, I never thought about this. And now it's an urgent or it's an important thing. And I do think and I've uh, you know, I don't have kids of my own, but I've watched my friends who I think are really exceptional parents. And a lot of the ones who I think did a really good job are the ones who set boundaries, actually enforce the boundaries, which I'm terrible at, uh, with my own kids who happen to have fur. And uh, they would create, they would put their children in situations where they would expect them to follow through. So they would take them to restaurants and teach them how to behave so that the kids weren't like, I can't imagine how to be in the restaurant. Or they would say, I'm going to be working and you do your own thing out there. And then the kids would learn, oh, I understand now how to be independent or I'm not going to be accessible by text because I have this really important meeting. And the kids learn, oh, I know how to handle my own emergencies. And I just feel like it it um, empowers the children in personal leadership also so that they grow up as these like an independent, empowered beings at an age appropriate time. So that to me is, uh, is really consistent with what you're talking about. 
Now, you have said a word which I am super fixated on, so we're going to have to spend a little time on um, on sabbatical before we wrap up. Can you talk about what on earth you mean by sabbatical? You have taken one uh, because you and I were just in touch while you were on sabbatical and you were saying, I can't talk right now, I'm on sabbatical. What is that and how do you manage to do that and keep everything else flowing? Okay. Great. So um, it's so serendipitous that we were just talking about kids because that's when this started. Uh, When I was pregnant with my first son, the one who's now 20, I took a maternity leave and I was like, I don't have a job. I I have my own company. Like, Uh how do you do that? And so I was like, well, I'm going to take three months off. So I like, you know, you have nine months lead time. So I told everyone that I was going to be taking a maternity leave and that these were kinds of, this, we were going to set everybody up so that they felt well cared for before I left, got them all things to do while I was away, picked up when I came back. And when I came back, I thought, well, that worked. All the clients are still here. I adjusted to having this new little baby. So like that worked too. So I started taking a sabbatical every summer and the summer aligns to the school calendar right? My kids are out. I'm out. My yep. college kid, his schedule shifts. College kids get out in May. Hmm, now my sabbatical's a month longer. So, you know, it's just like, I use it as a way of saying, uh, there are times in my life where I just, I just want to be on vacation or, or sabbatical. The word sabbatical comes from academia, which isn't actually a vacation. It's a, it's a space and a time where you use the opportunity to do something important to you. Sometimes that is a vacation. Sometimes it's writing a book. Sometimes it's doing research. Sometimes for me, it's just getting organized in the quiet of my office when I won't be interrupted. Sometimes it has nothing to do with work at all. But it's creating time and space for yourself that of a duration in which you can really have it protected space. And I have found that every year I feel better, clearer, more aligned to the vision that I have. And if you feel like when you start to take a sabbatical that something bad's going to happen, everyone's going to disappear, right? Um, I won't have any clients when I come back. Oh, I have to work and I have to make money. What's going to happen there? Like I wanted mm-hmm. to grow my business. I don't want to put it on pause. All I can tell you is that when you use that time strategically, just like everything else, you feel better. The clients are still there. The money will still be there. The clients will grow. Your business will grow because that's what you intended. I'm convinced. <laughs> I'm 85 percent convinced. Uh, I I love the idea. Uh, so I am very curious about it, and I think I'll be kind of exploring that uh, further uh, as we go. But for today, I think that's just enough of a little gold nugget to leave with our listeners uh, and to entice them to maybe they need to follow you and stay in touch with you. So where can I'll put your social links that link to your LinkedIn uh, and your website in the show notes, but where can our listeners find out more about you? And is there anything special that you have going on right now that they should know about? Well, yes, thank you. I, I absolutely invite all of you who are here with us today. You know, I've said before, we're all in this together and we are, we are all in this together. So Let's be in touch and talk about the things that are going through your mind, because I'm sure there are lots of questions and ideas and gremlins that, um, you know, we can talk through all that. So so thank you for posting those. I would say, you know, please go to my website. If if you're just intrigued or want to think further through this, you'll find my books are there, articles, resources of various kinds. So that's just joelkj.com. Um, the, the one thing, though, that I will say that you might treat yourself to a little um, executive coaching that you can, you know, hold in your hand. There's an assessment on the home screen of my website that is just a little quiz. I mean, it's like a five minute self assessment just to see, to ask yourself, am I leading myself? Am I practicing personal leadership? And if I, if I am or I'm not, where am I? Are there some things that I've mastered and I'm really good at? Like I'm great with the vision. I've got the time management down, but I just feel so alone. Or maybe like, um, you know, I have a team. I have a lot of support. I'm constantly learning things. I feel like I have what I need, but maybe I don't really have that that vision or 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 the action plan to, to get there. So that's what the self-assessment is for. It's just to put in front of you, here are the practices and principles of personal leadership just spend some time with yourself to say, you know, where am I taking the lead in my own life and, and where am I not? 
And is there one place that I might strengthen? That assessment was, has a few notes, like two or three follow up from me. So if you take the assessment, I'll kind of help you to transition into a place where instead of just listening to a podcast, which is a great start, you know, our session here, how can you carry it forward into your actual own life? Kind of get you on your feet. So that is available totally free. You know, I'd love to have you take that because I think it will get you started. Um, but you asked a question that I think is really important, which is, you know, is there anything special going on? And so this is for those of you who want to do more than that. Some of you are in a place right now where you're listening and you're like, this is for me. I did it. Like I did the 24 seven thing and that was super fun, but you know, I don't want to live this way anymore. I am ready to get that vision. I want to be in the place where I have success plus quality of life. I want to have a profitable, joyful business, right? How do I do this? And so um, there just happens to be a, a group starting that is just really amazing. And I highly recommend it. So um, briefly, my team designs and delivers leadership development for big companies like Microsoft and Accenture, Adobe, um, Intuit. And so those are, you know, top of the line, best in class, global leadership development programs that get, de de you know, results, right? We deliver for those corporate clients. And they always have a strong coaching component. And so people come out of that program feeling like, yeah, I'm achieving what I want to achieve and I'm leading the life I want to live. That's what I came for and that's what I'm doing. And my company's better for it because I'm getting the results. Well, I believe that everyone should have access to that kind of development program. We just don't all have the corporate budget to pay for it. Yeah, right. So um, my team puts together groups, small groups, like five, five people, like-minded souls, you know, who are, or who's, who have similar life experiences, similar businesses, similar visions for their life so that they can actually do the work and get the coaching, have the conversations, support each other, do the thinking, do the planning, try things out, get the feedback, get the encouragement, the motivation and the accountability and the structure. So it's not, um, it's not a heavy lift. It's not hard. It's affordable. It's accessible. Um, and we call it getting an edge. My book, The Inner Edge, is about the 10 practices of personal leadership. And getting an edge is the private, small, intimate, buy yourself a seat version of leadership circles. So we took what we do for Adobe and Microsoft and Intuit, and we just made it available to you, you know, our friends who are in the same boats we are, building our businesses, living our lives. And are also like in a place where we're like, yeah, no, I don't just want to think about it and talk about it. It's time to actually get that vision for myself. That's what we do in those programs. So that is available. And I, you know, if, if anyone, you know, is interested in just hearing more about that, you can just email me directly and I'll be happy to talk you through it and just share what it is. You know, no pressure. Um, but I do want to make sure the invitation is out there because I know that there are some of you who are ready for that. Absolutely. And uh, over the years of watching the programs you're doing, I know they're getting incredible results inside of companies. And I love that you're making that accessible to uh, leaders of small businesses and consultants outside of it. So thank you so much for that um, for that offer. Love it. We'll put uh, links to all of that in our show notes. Uh, if you ever have any trouble tracking Joelle down, you can um, message through me or through her website. And with that, Joelle, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and this, I think they're revolutionary ideas even today. A lot of the things that you're talking about are really going to be mind blowing for a lot of people who hear this. So thank you so much for sharing those and for coming on. Well, it's my pleasure. You are changing lives with all the work that you do. So thank you for the opportunity to join you in that today. It's just been a lot of fun. I'm, I've learned so much from you. Um, I would not be where I am today if it weren't for you. So thank you for you. Thank you for this podcast. And thank you for having me. Fabulous. And with that, Joelle and I are wishing you a profitable and joyful consulting business.